Please rise. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your grace. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Save me, O God, for the waters I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into the waters, and the blood over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, and an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. I am not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul. Redeem me. Ransom me because of my enemies. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. God of hope, in Christ's Passover from death to life, you have restored your fallen creation and raised up to life a people marked for death. Fill us with thanksgiving that we, who by the rescue of your grace have been made new, may delight in your ways, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
Testament reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and was esteemed him not, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We rise for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 18th chapter. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord my God. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me. You may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our text for our reading is from the Gospel of John today, and uh, the title is Malchus. If you recall, we're going through these witnesses of the Passion. But I want to see if you guys remember something, a weird fact from 2004. I had to make sure it was a true weird fact first, but it's a weird fact. Uh, a, a 66 ton sperm whale died and was beached on the shores of Taiwan. Two weeks later, it's still there. They decide to truck this dead whale into a, another facility, to a facility where they're going to do an autopsy and, and see what happened with this whale. So it took about 55 men and three cranes to lift up this whale, put it on the back of a semi-truck trailer, and there it went, started to go driving through the cities. One particular city on the way, and it happened. The whale exploded exploded and its guts went everywhere blood on the cars blood on the people they were all watching ready for this thing to come by they're all looking shut down the road for several hours I bet you they weren't expecting that <laughs> isn't that like how life is sometimes right we're going about our business and a whale explodes. <laughs> we are left hurt and confused. This is metaphor. Just okay. You got to make sure. I got to make sure you guys know what a metaphor is. Right? This is a metaphor for something else, right? We we uh, we are left hurt, and we are left confused. Lots of questions start to run through our minds when this tragedy happens. Why? Why? Why did it happen to them? Why did, it, why did it happen to me? Everything was going just fine. We were just getting back to normal. Why did this happen again? Why did this explosion happen? Why did it all have to break again? Why? Well, as we continue with our sermon series uh, this year, witnesses to Christ. We come to the Gospel of John and we get to meet a man named Malchus. Malchus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Malchus is going about his business, coming to arrest Jesus. That's all he was planning on doing, doing what he was told. And before he knows it, a whale explodes on him. Peter pulls out his sword, cuts off the right ear of Malchus from a, a fisherman from Galilee, nonetheless. I was thinking probably Malchus was not expecting that. But before the explosion, before the explosion, the storm crowds were being gathered. They were being collected by, nonetheless, one of Jesus' inner circle, one of his twelve, Judas. Some scholars try to cast Judas in a good light, saying that Judas was just trying to push Jesus in the right direction, as if Jesus didn't know the right direction. But we're going to push Jesus in the right direction to get him to get his kingdom to come now, to get him to get his rule to come now. That would be kind of nice. But what does scripture actually say? Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. The band were Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers would show up the next day as well. They would show up to mock Jesus, to flog Jesus, to crucify Jesus. 
But that's not all that was in the crowd. We had the crowd there with the Romans, and that kind of expresses the country, you know. They were in control of the country. You had the chief priests who were in control of the temple. They controlled all that happened in the temple. Then you had the Pharisees who controlled the religion. This is like the Supreme Court and the Congress, and if we had a state-run church, sending in the FBI to arrest Jesus. Judas. What's up with Judas? Betrayal. Every time we celebrate communion, every Sunday, not just every Sunday, every time we celebrate communion, we hear these words on the night when he was betrayed. That's this night. That's this night when Jesus was betrayed. Who's in control? Who's in control? Is it the high priests? Is it the Romans? Is it Judas? It might appear that these guys are running the show. And I put a big emphasis on appear. Because Christ is the one who is really in control. How so? Scripture tells us Jesus knowing all that would happen to him came forward. See, the control is clear. When Jesus' enemies come, Christ goes out to meet them. When Judas approaches, Christ doesn't run. When Peter strikes Malchus on the ear, cuts off his ear, Jesus commands Peter to put away your sword. Who's in control? Listen to what Jesus says. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. Though the powers of darkness rise against him, full throttle going at him, Christ is in control. Matthew's gospel tells us that at this point in, in, his gospel, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus could ask his father, God, to send him more than 12 legions of angels. 12 legions of angels. Roman legion was 6,000 men. 12 times 6,000, you get to do the math, 12,000 angels. We know from, from 2 Kings what one angel can do. 185,000 Assyrians dead in an instant. One angel. Imagine 72,000. But Christ does not need 72,000 angels because the Son of God is in control, absolute control. See, popular wisdom tells us we always need to seek control. And you don't need a war like Putin's war to show somebody wanting to control somebody else. We see control in every day of our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our friend groups, in our churches. And everywhere else you come in contact, there is always a control issue. So what's the plan when the whale explodes? Well, you can again go with popular wisdom, always seek to take control, which means that you would now board an airplane with a parachute, just to make sure you're gonna take control of it. Never leave the house without a gas mask, because you never know. Never step on a crack because you just may break your mother's back. Make sure you have enough money, enough money to face every explosion that goes on. Make sure you are prepared for every outcome of this sin-broken life. That's it. Face every explosion by taking control of it. There's only one problem with this popular wisdom. It doesn't work. I know it's hard to grasp, but rather than seeking control, maybe we should relinquish control. Give up a little control. Let go. Stop reigning 
as CEO of your little world, of your universe. (laughs) Give control back to the one for whom all things work for your good. And we've heard it before and we'll hear it again. Christ's control is clear. And his control brings peace and calmness. And his calmness and his peace is meant to be contagious. As Jesus speaks of one of his father's promises. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. See, Christ is calm because he trusts in the scriptures. He trusts in his Father's true word. Christ's calm is meant to be contagious through the word of his Father. Contagious. I'm going to change tactics here on you kind of quickly. Maybe you guys are old enough to remember a comic strip. It's called Peanuts. Right? Lucy... Charlie, Snoopy, and the rest of the gang. Great comic strip because oftentimes we would bring in these little biblical references, these spiritual references, these Christian references. And, and, and Lucy does one in such strip here. She says, um, she says, finally, she's struggling with re- a memory verse. She's struggling with a memory verse. And finally, she, stru- she, she suggests maybe the verses from Reevaluations, the book of reevaluations. You know that as Revelations. But maybe in one aspect, we can take Lucy's point here. The book of reevaluations. Maybe the scriptures, in one way, not the only way, but in one way, could be seen as a reevaluation. A reevaluation of who really is in control. John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not just a little sin, not just some sin, but the Lamb who takes away all sin. He's in control. John 4. Whoever drinks, Jesus says, whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Christ is in control of our aching thirst. And I'm not just talking drinking water, but our spiritual desire, our spiritual hope, our eternal hope, our quest for the truth, our quest for forgiveness, and our quest for unconditional love that he pours out through him, through his son, Jesus Christ. John 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Christ is in control of darkness. He is the light of the world. Sin and darkness can spring upon you and explode like a whale. Yet Jesus has promised, the Father and the Son have promised to send you and have sent you the Holy Spirit. Who does what for you? He guides you into God's word. He strengthens you with his sacraments. He sings over you with his psalms and his hymns. He listens to your prayers. Here in the midst of the brokenness, Christ is in control and he gives you himself so that you would not lose control. When parents send their children to camp, uh, there's often this line, uh, who's responsible (laughs) Right. Who's responsible for this kid if it breaks its leg? <laughs> Who's responsible for this kid if it gets the measles? And then the parent signs its name there at the bottom. Christ has signed his name to you. He wrote it in his own blood. When you were baptized, Jesus took full responsibility for you. When the whale explodes... Jesus is the responsible party, not you. It's his job to see you through. Christ, as we hear, is the shepherd, and you are the sheep. Christ is the bridegroom, and you are the bride. 
Christ is the rabbi, and you are the disciples. Great hymn, portion of a great hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Not on my own, but in the control of Jesus. One of three things is happening in your life right now. You're either heading for a mess, you are in a mess, or you're coming out of a mess. No matter what stage you're in, we do not have to become helpless or anxious or filled with anxiety. We can stay calm. Why? Because when when whales explode and our ears get cut off, figuratively or literally, Jesus delivers his perfect life for yours. Jesus gives you his perfect peace for your chaos. He gives you his hands to pull you out of your muck and mire and deliver you with his grace. There's where peace is. And God gives you that peace now and forevermore. Who's in charge? And if you don't believe me, ask that guy Malchus, who had his ear restored like that. Amen. Amen. Please rise. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowliness of his enemy. For behold, the he has been all generations of all men blessed. For the mighty one has done great things to me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. May be seated for our hymn.
Please rise. We pray, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, Hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, ruler of all things, and God of all consolation, your Son healed every manner of infirmity and disease, and so displayed your mercy toward the sick and the suffering. Mercifully come to the aid of your servants, that according to your merciful will, they may be delivered from illness, restored to health, strengthened in faith, and offer you the thanks and praise of a grateful heart. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Deliver us, O Lord, from temptation to manage and control the troubles and uncertainties of this mortal life, and grant us faith in you, that our peace may come not from the things around us, but from the grace and mercy you have manifested upon the cross once for all. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.